The next speaker then is Marie-Hélène uh, Mayron. Marie-Hélène will tell us about integrating HPV vaccination, screening, and treatment in developed countries. Marie-Hélène. So good afternoon. I've been asked to tell you about how we could integrate HPV vaccination and cervical cancer screening um, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, I'm a practicing colposcopist in uh, Montreal, Canada. I'm also an epidemiologist and a public health specialist, so I'll try to wear all my hats this afternoon to um, give you a little perspective on this. And I found the topic um, challenging because, as you know, we've just started vaccination, and so we don't have any data yet to make evidence-based recommendation on how we could change screening for the vaccinated cohort. So what I'm giving you this afternoon are essentially my thoughts, and I've tried to propose some um, very different things. Hopefully, we'll have an interesting discussion after. So I essentially receive salary support and um, grant funding from, from uh, government agencies. So I thought I would start by looking at the past. And you'll see most of my examples are from Canada. Those were the data I had at hand. But I think also they represent what's go been going on uh, generally in developed countries. So those, you can see the mortality and incident rates from cervical cancer. And I don't have on the graph, but actually in the early 1960s, we were at close to 30 per 100,000. So it's been going down drastically. How did we achieve that? Well, we did a lot. We did a lot of pap, a lot of colposcopies, conization, hysterectomies. So I've put a summary there, but um, if some of you are practicing clinicians, you will probably remember that not too long ago, a woman to get a birth control prescription would have to get a pap somehow. So we would start screening at sexual debut. We were, when I was training, we were still doing PAP every year, so that's in the, the 90s. And so if you calculate that, some women were getting 50 screen cycles in their lifetime. Everyone with any abnormality was sent to colposcopy and any CIN was treated. Again, I can remember when I was training that it was not all that rare for a woman with CIS to be booked for a hysterectomy. So as you saw in the first graph, we did make an impact on cervical cancer incidence and mortality, but maybe we did just a little too much. So what happened in the late 90s is that we finally got a clear uh, understanding of the natural history of HPV that was identified as uh, the causal factor and CIN and cancer. And I would say the main changes was that CIN1 was essentially starting to be viewed as just an expression of HPV infection and that the true precursors were the CIN2 and 3. And we also understood that HPV infection most often is transient, especially in younger women. And so this gave us the possibility, now that we had identified the, the risk factor, to intervene all along the spectrum of, of what we can do. And so the fact that we identified the causal agent made it possible to do primary prevention, so essentially education and vaccination. In the case of cervical cancer, I personally don't think that education will do much to curb incidence and mortality, because you would essentially have to convince people to not have sex. And so we can have this conversation later. I just don't think it's very practical. Education is important. I mean, women want to know more. They want to understand. But like I said, I don't think it's going to have a big impact on, on cancer rates. So it made it possible to develop HPV testing. So we incorporated that in screening. We didn't change colposcopy and biopsy all that much, but it did change uh, which treatment we did. 
So I just want again to give you, the when I say the example of Canada, I don't know if it's my English, I don't want to say that Canada is an example. I just want to say that I'm using this data to, to discuss what's going on. So you have to remember that Canada is a federation and health matters are of provincial jurisdiction, which means that we have all kind of different things. But all provinces now have HPV immunization programs. They're population-based. I'm from Quebec, so we're targeting grade four girls, and currently we're giving two doses, and we're considering if we're going to give the third dose or not. And we have coverage rates of around 80%, so we feel pretty good about uh, what we've done. And then in the recent years, we've reworked our screening algorithms. We're mostly using PAP. And like I put on the bottom of the slide, I, I gather that information from websites. So it's possible that not all the websites were 100% up to date. But again, it's just to give you a general idea. So we're starting PAP later. And the interval has gone longer. We're still doing it up mostly until 70. Who do we send for diagnosis? So as you know, HSIL is the easy part. When you get an HSIL result, you refer the woman for colposcopy. The difficult part is uh, equivocal or mildly abnormal smears. And I think the fact that not one province is doing the same thing illustrates that we're not 100% sure of uh, what we should be doing. And we've moved away from treating CIN1, and we have moved away from invasive treatments, so we are hopefully not doing hysterectomies anymore. We are almost doing no uh, cold knife colonization, mostly leaps. And um, so if I put this in a table, so we're, now we've added uh, vaccination. We're still doing PAP and using HPV mostly for um, ASCIS triage. We're starting later, interval longer. So you can see that the number of screen cycles has gone dramatically down. And because we're not sending all ASCIS to COPO, so the, the proportion of women sent for a diagnosis has gone down uh, also. For the treatment part, we're still treating most women with CIN3, but we're moving away from treating CIN2, especially in um, younger women. And so now I've been asked to discuss the future, which I don't know. But I think our biggest challenge will be to find a better balance between the benefits and the disadvantages. Maybe some of you have read the few studies that have come out recently about um, breast cancer screening, where finding this balance between benefits and disadvantages is really the, the hot topic of the moment. I think we're pretty good at defining benefits. So we want to decrease mortality. We want to decrease incidence. And in the case of cervical cancer, uh, doing screening can certainly reduce morbidity. Because as you know, finding, even if you find a pre-cancer, if you find cancer, I'm sorry, but it's a microinvasive lesion, you can essentially cure it with a leap, as opposed to finding it only if it's a stage two lesion, then the woman is going to have a radical hysterectomy, probably chemo. And so just downstaging a little bit has a huge impact. So defining the disadvantages, some are easier. So when you look at cost effectiveness studies, the cost of everything you can find. So the number of vaccine shots will uh, impact on the cost, the number of screening tests, of diagnosis, of treatment. What we're having more difficulty in putting into our models and our thoughts is all the, the, the disadvantages that, of course, are not, they're not big disadvantages. So discomfort from vaccination, the small local reactions. There are a few severe reactions, but there is anxiety from the abnormal screening test, the discomfort of the pelvic exam, 
And this we should take uh, into account. Right before I was leaving, a young colleague of mine who has just started her practice, so she's a gynecologist and she's pregnant. And so she came to me, she had just gone for her first pregnancy examination and she goes, we really do forget how uncomfortable that is. And I, I think we do. And so keeping that in mind, I think that also we have to bring to mind what the new natural history of HPV will be. And so let's dream for a minute that we vaccinated every girl before she was sexually active. And we've essentially wiped out 16 and 18 because our vaccines are uh, efficacious on the long term. So this would mean that the infections would be by other types. And if you look at what I circled in red, so the impact is that there would be a fewer proportion of HPV infections that would go on to precursor and that would go on to invasive lesion. The other impact is that because the other types are less aggressive, it's possible that the time between the different stages will be longer. So we would see the peak in precursor lesion slightly later than the peaks we're seeing now that in young women are mostly driven by HPV-16 infection. So what would the impact be? So again, we're dreaming. We think that cancer incidence could decrease by 70% and precursor incidence could decrease by as much as 50%. And the biggest challenge with that will be a loss of proficiency in professionals who must identify those precursors. So that's cytotechnicians, colposcopists, pathologists, and I think we need to be ready for that. In an earlier session, you were told how important it is to have colposcopy done by someone who does a lot of colposcopy. But now, even colposcopists who do a lot of colposcopy may not see that many lesions. And we will have to have quality assurance in place and find a way to deal with that. The other challenge is that we will have a loss in positive predictive values of all our screening and diagnostic procedures. So if you remember EPI 101, um, so predictive values are closely linked to prevalence. As, as, and as prevalence falls, so do the predictive values. So this means that if we keep on doing pap testing, most women who have, uh, well, it's already the case, but even a lower number of women with abnormal paps will have a lesion. And so this is what I've done to try and spark discussion. So, Again, we're dreaming and we're in 50 years. So it's been 50 years that we've been vaccinating all the young girls before they're sexually active. And if we've reached a, a sufficient coverage, then I don't think it would make sense to use pap testing anymore. We will have to switch to another type of test. And what we have to realize is that the generic tests that we're using now, so if it's testing for 14 types, the positive predictive value is mostly driven by the fact that there's 16 in there. If you take out 16, the positive predictive value of the generic HPV test will fall also. So we may need to go to type-specific HPV tests or maybe to some completely different other biomarker. And uh, just to be clear, I'm not saying we should go back to our practice and stop using pap test on young women who have been vaccinated. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that eventually we'll have data to inform us, and I'm trying to see where we'll be in 50 years. So for now, we keep doing what we're doing. So you remember I said the, if we take out 16 and 18, it's possible that the peak will be later because it will take a longer time for the less aggressive HPVs to cause precursors. So maybe we will be able to start screening later and to lengthen the interval. And maybe, you know, we started at 50 screen cycles per life, we're down at approximately 15. Could we go down to five to 10? That would be great. 
Another thing is that if we have a new screening test, we will need to devise, uh, to, to decide what's the threshold and what would be the greatest thing is if we could better define which precursors are most likely to progress to cancer and restrict our treatment on those precursors. And so this is what we need to work on. Uh, for all uh, jurisdiction, we need to increase vaccination coverage, and we definitely need to get the vaccination to women before sexual debut. So if we get out of politics, it just makes no sense to vaccinate someone after they've been infected. Maybe we'll be able to decrease the number of vaccines. There's a, a, a lot of interest in that. We'll want to increase screening coverage. And like I said, I think there is a lot of work that will have to be done on new screening tests for cohorts that have been uh, vaccinated. And in conclusion, I think that finding the cause of cervical cancer has made it possible for us to do better. I think we will get those rates of incidence and mortality down. But to me, what's really exciting is that I think we'll be able to do that while we do considerably less procedures on women. So thank you.